All right, good afternoon. Um, I see we have a, a, quite a few people on, so let's get started. Uh, this is a QTL analysis, part of the uh, computational session. Uh, Maria, I think you're going to start, correct? Yes, I will start, and then it will be Gabriel. Okay, so I'm going to unshare and, and let you take over. So Maria Carasa Harter will be taking over to explain what she does and, and how to do some QTL analysis. So hello, everyone. I'm Maria Carasa Harter. I'm a researcher at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and I work in potato breeding. So today I will be helping you on the third session of the computational session uh, that is where I'm mostly focusing on QTL mapping. I will cover today, uh, this tutorial will cover first uh, the genotype calls using polybreeder, uh, which uses a feed poly. Uh, uh, the feed poly uh, package. And then we are going to go through the haplotype reconstruction using poly origin. And uh, further, we will use this uh, with data that we're going to generate to do some joint linkage mapping using DiaQTL. And uh, we'll finalize doing some genome wide association using uh, GWAS poly. So the data set that I'm sharing with you today and uh, <coughs> This chicken is sharing right now the link. So this data set is being published already in this paper, the genetic architectures of vine and skin maturity in tetraploid potatoes. For this uh, data set that I, I will give you a little more details, but right now you have the data set link and I guess we can go from there. All right, so this is the link that Jacob has shared with you. Uh, can, is everybody there already? All right, I will just make it a little bigger. So when you're on this website, uh, what I would like you to do is to go here and code and download zip. So then you can download all the folders at the same time. good it might take it shouldn't take too long because the data set it's not that big so jk was you able to download it yes okay great so here while we are still here you can click on this link the tutorial link and I will start explaining you here, and then we're going to go into the downloaded files. If you can use the emojis of these, it might really help me to know that things are working out for you. All right. Um, so this data set is including data that was generated in our potato breeding program. Mm. All right, uh, we already published this data and what we are including here is, uh, is the data set for first for three interconnected populations that share three parents. And uh, we have around 500 breeding lines. So the first part includes the genotyping. For this example, I will, uh, I have data for, uh, uh, so these, these lines were genotyped with the potato snip array. Uh, the version that we use has around 20,000 markers. But for most of the softwares that I will be explaining, you can also use it with GBS data. Uh, but in this case, we're working with the snip array data. After we genotype this, uh, these uh, breeding lines, we uh, extracted the data sets from Genome Studio. So when you SNP genotype this, uh, you will get uh, the X and Y ratios for each of the markers for each uh, of the samples. And 
FitPoly is one of the softwares that will allow you to do the genotype calls from this uh, data. I know that Chris uh, went through some of these on the first computational session, so I will not give a lot of details, but what I wanted to share with you today is that to use the FitPoly uh, software, uh, there is a very easy way for you to do the genotype calls using this new package, PolyBreeder. This package was developed by Jeffrey Andelman. So if you open this, uh, you can see their uh, GitHub website. And here, uh, pretty much what this package does, uh, it will make the, tetraplo the tetraploid genotype calls from the SNP array intensities. And this uh, package has been trained of, on around 2,000 samples from our breeding program. Uh, and by only using this function, genocall, you should be able to generate the genotype calls using the feed poly, uh, the field poly uh, package, but in a much easier way. Uh, the other advantage of using polybreed is that you can also check the parentage of your population. So you can check their pedigree and make sure that everything is, should be the way you have coded it. And I think that's very important for all these uh, type of analysis because you will rely on their pedigree. So once you have generated the genotype calls, uh, that's where we are going to start our, our tutorial. And we are going to use these genotype calls to uh, perform the haplotype reconstruction. To do this, we're going to use a poly origin. These software has been developed to run in Julia. Uh, for you to be able to follow this part, uh, it will be required that you already downloaded Julia on your computer. This takes a little bit of time. So if you haven't and you don't have it already on your computer, uh, we're just going to follow this, this uh, tutorial part. Otherwise, uh, you could run it at the same time. So I am going to open Julia and we're going to go from there. Once you have Julia open, uh, and I have the version 1.7, I know that there is newer version, so you will have to double check by going to this link for your region that uh, this has been updated because it works. It has happened before that it worked with a previous version of Julia and not the updated one. It is very straightforward. Uh, so I have wrote already the code here for you to use. You will need to make sure that you are changing the working directory to where you have uh, downloaded the files. In my case, I just have it on downloads. And first you start just saying using poly origin. And if you are used to uh, working in R, it's just pretty much like calling a library. And then you will load uh, the two files that you need for this analysis, which is the genome file with, where you have all the genotype calls and the pedigree file. After you call the, these files, you, uh, I will suggest you that you check on the files to make sure that they are looking the way it's required to. So, there is three other uh, packages that you use in Julia, the CSV, the data frames, and the plots. So here I have both of the files. First, on the pedigree file, we have at the very top the three parents. Like I said, this is a, uh, a dial experiment with three parents. You will call them at zeros, and after that, you will have all your progeny and then you will assign them to different populations based on who are their parents. And you also are, are listing here their mother, their father, and the ploidy, that in our case, all of our lines are tetraploids. From last uh, workshop, we know that the developer was working into trying to combine different ploidy levels in this part. So we will hear some updates about this uh, in January. So hopefully that is available now. After you check that your files uh, are good and they have the good format that you need, 
For the genotypes, uh, you will have for each marker, their chromosome and their physical position. If you have uh, the genetic position, you could also uh, have that here instead. And then the first, the first columns here should be for the parents of your populations and that will follow by all the other individuals. So polyorigin also will allow, allow you, after you enter all these uh, data sets, you could see how uh, your population is, uh, was developed that in this case, the output for that will be showing you this interconnected, all the parents that you are using on your population and how many individuals you have coming from these, each of these families. So I have 397 individuals on this specific analysis. And it takes some time. Um, okay, it is here now. And the plot generated, oh, I have it right here. Is, is, is this one the same that I have uploaded on the tutorial? where it will give you more detail about how your populations are connected. So when we are running uh, Julia, there is different parameters that you could change. Uh, for anyone that is uh, running it right now on their computer, I have wrote this, this uh, script here, but here I'm only analyzing the first chromosome of the data set. For you to analyze the whole data set, you will have to put here one to 12 because potatoes have 12 chromosomes. And here on the SNP uh, subset, uh, you also can leave it out. So then it will go through all of your SNPs. And uh, if you want to run it right now, you can paste all this code in Julia and it will take about eight minutes to run just for the first chromosome with this uh, subset of SNPs. If you run it for the whole data set without these uh, SNP subset, it will take from eight to nine hours, depending on how powerful is your computer. You can also run it in parallel in different computers by having these uh, set as true. And definitely that will save you a lot of time if, if you are able to, to run it in parallel. I have uh, run this already and I have the, the outputs saved in what I have shared with you. So we are just going to go from there because we will be using that for the following analysis. But what you will expect is to have seven different out files or these files will be automatically saved in the same folder where you, are, uh, where you have changed your directory. So this is automatically generated on your computer. And here, uh, from all these files, the file that we will be using for further analysis will be this one that is named Poly Ancestry. So here, what, uh, what you have done is to generate uh, the genotype probabilities for each of the markers to belong to one of their haplotypes. And in this example right here, so I have uh, only for the analysis for chromosome one and chromosome two, and since these are tetraploids, we have four haplotypes that come from the mother and four that come from the father. And then uh, when you look at the haplotype probabilities, the genotype probabilities, you could also see the recombination events. So for instance, this individual, the individual W15, this individual right here, will have inherited the haplotype one from uh, the haplotype one, and then there was a recombination event and it changed to the haplotype three. And in this case, it has a haplotype four and then a haplotype two. So for each of the markers, this is uh, their physical position. Uh, you will get this, this haplotype map. And uh, this is very good to see the recombination events. And I believe that um, G can mention last time that if you have the, uh, the physical position of the markers and you would like to calculate the genetic position, you will need to have uh, here specify what is the combination rate for your crop. 
Uh, in this case, for potato, we use 1.25, but you will have to change this uh, according to what is the recommendation rate in the crop that you're using. And now we will start doing the, the tutorial in R. So you will go to your downloads. Um, you go to your downloads and you will need to unzip the folder that you downloaded from GitHub. Are you there? Yes. Okay, so then you go on tutorial and you're going to open this file. This has the RMD and it will open on uh, RStudio. Where is everybody able to open the file? Okay. Great. Uh, okay, so now we're here. Uh, all this introductory part is what I already explained to you. And we're going to go to line 113. That that's when we are going to start doing the QTL mapping. So we are going to be using uh, DiaQTL, which uh, does recommend that use poly origin to calculate the genotype probabilities for the tetrapoids. This uh, poly origin, uh, we have tested also on, on, on diploids and it works as well. And DiaQTL has also been designed not only to work with polyploids, also with diploids. Uh, so if you have other types of ploidies, this should work. So we are going to start by, if any of you have not installed DiaQTL before, uh, you should be running these lines here. And you can run them directly here on your console. I'm not going to start it because I haven't installed beforehand. So for anybody installing it for the first time, please let me know if you already were able to. Otherwise we will jump into calling the package. So we call the package in library diaqtl and for plotting some of these uh, results, we will also require ggplot. All right, so we start by setting our working directory. When you go to downloads, you open the file. And data, you can see that- Oh yeah, it does, it does exist. Wait, um, let me see. We need to first set the working directory in the R session, set it to where the RMD is. Right. So go go up to session. So Here. Up, 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 keep going up. Up, no. up on your, uh, R, on your uh, taskbar, in the oh, Mac okay. taskbar, go to session. Yeah. And first set the working directory to where your RMD is. So set that to source file location. Now it should work. Okay. So is anybody else following? Can you do that too? Say again, please. Okay, so you go to session and then set working directory to source file location. Yes, it should work. Did it work, Alexander? Yes, oh, that's great. So we should be able to run this now. All right. Okay, so here is uh, we what we're doing is using 
uh, poly breeder to convert the file from poly origin into uh, the file that we're going to use in DIAQTL. So when we do that, what is happening is that um, here, is that it's going to generate these to wherever you have set your working directory, it will generate these three files that are named diaqtl underscore genophile, the parents and the pet file, which are the, the three files that you will need to run diaqtl. Um, so when you run that, so these three files are going to be generated inside this folder. Do you see them? And again, I, I have already saved those files for you. So even if that, that should have worked, but even if not, you still should be able to run the rest of the code. So first we're going to start uploading the pedigree file. Yeah, can did it work? Yes, Chris. Okay, so it's working for you, Chris, too. Yes, it's working here. Just need to set the working directory into the inside the the, the folder that you asked to download. Right, and that's running perfectly. Okay, that's great. So this is the first file. This is the pedigree file. Uh, again, all these files were generated by using uh, the function in Polybreed, and that should be very easy. We have all the individuals with their, uh, parent, with their parents, and then we have the genome file. You run this chunk. You can see that for each of the markers, we have the chromosome. And uh, PolyOrigin also calculated the genetic position, and we also have their physical position. And uh, after these, the rest of the columns are uh, for each of the individuals, the genotype probabilities generated in PolyOrigin. And the third file is the phenotype file, which in our case, we will be uh, looking at the vine maturity uh, trait. That is the trait that I chose for this tutorial. So after you check that all your files are in and you they look great, you are going to uh, read the data using read data from uh, the IQTL. So this will take about five minutes uh, to run if anybody starts now. In the meantime, maybe we can take some questions or I can give you some more details about this. So. A few details is that uh, DIAQTL does allow you also that on your phenotypic data, you will have factors. For instance, if you haven't calculated the blues for your data and you have, for instance, environment here as another column and all that, you should be able to specify it here. Uh, and you will just make a list of having a factor and whether this is numeric or a factor. And some other times, also for some other traits, you will have another trait as a cofactor for your model. So all of this is available. Uh, you, you can model for that. So we, we have a couple of questions. Jada says, where does mapping, mapping position comes from? So you started having the physical position of your markers and uh, poly origin, if you give them the recombination rate for your crop, it will generate the genetic position. And I know some of you can have calculated that with other softwares as well. So uh, you, you can get that data from uh, other outputs as well. So, but that was generated in this case in poly origin. Uh, AJ says, so both the genome file well, I'm guessing the pedigree and the genome file is needed. What if only one is available? 
uh, you need to have the pedigree file because DIACTL is using also interconnected populations, interconnected F1 populations. So then you need to know where each of them comes from. If you don't know that, uh, I mean, all these populations, the three populations that I have are interconnected, you can check their parental, uh, you can share check their parents also using polybreeder. There is a function for check the parents, but yeah, you, you will need a pedigree file. So why, why this was designed? Because most of the times uh, for breeding programs, we will have interconnected populations as we use some of the parents for more than one cross. And this pretty much resembles the data that you currently will have on your breeding program. In this case, it was a dilil experiment. Ajay, I, um, I'm not sure about what you mean. Is the pedigree file same as kinship matrix? No, the pedigree file is what the breeder like knows as the mother and the father. So you have an individual column, you have a mother column, and then you have a father ID column. The kinship yeah, matrix would be uh, would be something that's calculated from the genotypic data. So this is the pet file. You have each individual, the parent one and the parent two. So is everything, are you still running this? You can also change the number of cores that you're using depending on what computer you have. I know that some people had only four cores, so I'm running it with three, but you can increase that. Um, any other questions? You have around, Jada has around 45 S1 in one of your data sets. An interconnected sports style is that too few? It should work. I have uh, used also, but I have used it with diploids that have a much smaller number of individuals. In this case, we have 397. Um, you could try, but how many parents do you have in this interconnected dialogue, Jada? How many parents does this 45 comes from? Yeah, hello, 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 Maria. Hi. Uh, th there are about uh, 19 full zip families, approximately 45 full zip families, uh, no, full zip individuals within each family. And I oh, do okay. not recall. Uh, so there are something like 850 F1s and uh, let me say from the top of my head, um, 13 ish uh, parents. So, if you have 45 individuals for each of the crosses, that should work. So, I'm wondering now if you have, uh, so this is interconnected, right? So, the mother has been crossed with several fathers. They're all, they're all interconnected. Oh, yeah, that, I think that should definitely work. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, and what crop are you working on? Um, potato in this case. Okay, yes. Uh, if you have any question, uh, when you use your own data set with these, you can always reach to me on Slack or on my email. And I think I share my email, but I can just type it down. I was just wondering because you have your your uh, your data set is something like 150 ish uh, F1s and uh, yeah yeah that was more recent oh, for us right oh I see I see because here you see that there is at least a 143 individuals yeah no I, the thing is that here there is only three interconnected families but if you're saying that you have more parents and for instance these this uh, parent has been tested with others, so that increases the power of uh, 
identifying the haplotypes and doing the haplotype mapping. So that, that's how you should not count just how many you have in this cross, is how many crosses come from this pattern. So in, in total, how many individuals there, I'm, I'm sure you have a lot more. <clears throat> and this is still working. <laughs> so any other question? So most people that are working with tetraploid potatoes, uh, all these packages have been designed uh, using potato data set. I know that it does work with other polyploids. It's not just for potatoes. And uh, for poly origin, it does work with tetraploids, but I know that the developer, Chelsea, he was working on trying to expand these to higher ploides. So we might be able to hear about this during uh, the workshop in January. Uh, I'm wondering if there is people here that have higher ploides. All right, did it finish? Did it finish for you? Not yet. Okay, so that uh, will read in the data. And here on the output, we can see that we have 394 individuals that have pedigree and genotype data uh, and phenotypes. Sometimes if you have the phenotype for more individuals, but they didn't have the pedigree of the genotype, here it will let you know, and it still should be able to work. It will just not consider them for the analysis. Uh, after that, you're going to run this scan one. We'll, uh, this should be much faster. Jackie, did you still, are you still working on reading the data? Mine's still reading in the data. Okay. Hopefully finish soon, but it, okay, we have another question in the meantime. What was used, uh, Lily is asking, what was used to generate this genotype information in the first place? Is GBS, no, I think I mentioned it at the beginning, this is a SNP array data. So all these individuals were genotyped using the potato SNP array, uh, the version four, which has around 20,000 SNPs. You can use GBS data too, uh, if you have that, and you can start like to generate a haplotype, the genotype probabilities in poly origin, you will just need to have previously the genotype calls. So that's what you will use using for that. You would have to go from VCF to some, some kind of software where you get a dosage before you can go mm -hmm. into poly origin. Once you have a dosage, it doesn't really matter if it was GBS or a reg, because we've done both. Right. Another question. So Todd Anderson is asking me, I have a mix of tetraploids and exaploids, but since, but since the exaploids are only a handful of commercial checks, uh, I was thinking just analyzing separately. Um, um, multiple ploidy levels. So I, um, that's a good question. So you're talking about the part uh, for the genotype calls and poly origin, or you're talking about the QTL? For a QTL. For a QTL. Um, I haven't mixed in here diploids, but what I'm thinking is that since here, um, what you have is the genotype uh, probabilities that you generated previously on uh, poly origin, right? So if you have lower ploidy levels, it will only mean that you only have, you have less haplotype possibilities for each of those parents. So it might be hard to make ploidies. I remember that Chelsea mentioned something about this last year as well. And I don't know, Jake, have you tried to have different ploid levels? Uh, not using DIAQTL, we haven't. But the question is, so are your mapping populations tetrapoid? Well, <laughs> um, mostly yes, but we do have 
a future. So I have blueberries. So I have Northern Habits blueberry and I have rabbit eye blueberries in the same field. Uh, when the experiment was set up, we had the rabbit eyes planted out as a check and we just took tissue and how to analyze and we have the dosages from them. But the mapping population is tetraploid, which makes it kind of. <laughs> I would probably, if that was me, if I'm understanding correctly, the hexaploid, since they were just, they're probably just phenotypic checks, right? Yes, they are. If they're just phenotypic checks, then I would, like uh, in your mixed modeling, whatever, you can take into account those phenotypic checks um, to combine sites or combine years or whatever. But for the purpose of running DACUTL, um, you're going to only apply, uh, for each genotype, you're only going to have one phenotype number for whatever chart you're looking at. So you're going to run your mixed models. You're going to use your checks, even though they're hexaploid, you're going to use those checks um, to kind of account for the differences in your different um, locations or years. And then the, the value that you get from the, the blue or the blop or whatever you're going to use um, for each one of those uh, individuals will go into DocUTL. I hope that helps. No, it does. Thank you. Yes. So even for this experiment, uh, we always use varieties as checks. They are not included in the data set, but they were included to calculate the blues. So we have 10 varieties that uh, in the paper, you can read it too. You have, uh, we have varieties that were used as checks. Once we calculate the blues, we remove them because uh, they, they are not going to uh, be analyzed for uh, interconnected mapping population. They, they are not part of the parents or anything else. So if and that, correct, what's that? And cor correct me if I'm wrong, but I think even in the phenotype file, even if you have the checks in there, but they're not in the genotype file, the, the software will account for it by itself. Yeah, yes, it will just kick them out. So if yeah. your phenotype file, but I think he has the, the genotype file. He has both, I think. Too. Yeah, yeah, so that, that you will yeah, need to be careful out. there. You have to remove them from the genotype file to make sure that they are not accounted. And it, it might throw you an error, I'm, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. if you have them included. All right, it, did it finish or is it still work running mm -hmm. for you? I am on the scan one step now. Okay, you're on scan one. Okay, I don't know so anybody else if is how anybody far else running at, for anyone who's running it? Would you let me know if it's still running for you or if you're there? I'm done with the scan one. But Theron is saying that it's working for Chris is working fine here. So everybody's done all the way to scan one whoever is following, that's great. All right. Okay, sounds good. In the meantime, we will just explain a little bit about detection thresholds. So uh, as you were asking me before, how do you know the, gen the genetic position? It was calculated in, in poly origin. And then uh, for determining your detection threshold, so there is a function that the name is DIC trash. So you can detect the detection threshold at 0.05 or 0.1, depending on what you would like to do on your study. First, you will need to calculate the, uh, the, the genome size of your data set. And for that, uh, you use the function get map. So when you run that, it will tell you. It will tell you that the total map size for you, for in our case, for these uh, potatoes is 13.12. And that's what you're going to need to enter in this uh, and this function, the genome size, the number of parents, in our case is three parents, the ploidy level, which is four, and the alpha that you're using. So when we run this, we can see that our detection thresholds are either 17.74 or 20.04. 
and you you can see which ones you would like to use for your study. We're going to use here the the alpha the point one. So we are now going to see what QTL we found. Is it working? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you run a scan one summary, and then you are going to find that inside the plot, maybe here will be easier to see. We were able to identify a QTL on chromosome five, which in our case was expected because there is a gene here, the CDF gene that is in charge of fine maturity in potatoes. Uh, it's, it's a pretty well-studied gene. I just wanted to use one that is very clear for people to see. Uh, based on our threshold, we have another QTL on chromosome four. Um, we can go a little farther in this. So once we identify our QTLs, we can run this to see all the peaks. It will show you for each of the chromosomes, where is the peak? And we know that we have QTLs that are significant on chromosome four and five. So we can uh, try to do, uh, we're going to try to fit a model for that QTL. And for this, we are going to use the function feed QTL in here, uh, you are going to put uh, the data that you uh, read in, the trait, the parameters. You can also change these parameters. These are the standard parameters. And on QTL, you can, if you have only one QTL, here you're going to just put the name of, you, of that uh, marker that is listed here. So for instance, on chromosome five, we will just have this QTL, we will put the name of this marker. But since we have two, I'm putting both of these markers. And we are going to feed the QTL here. Uh, we already ran this. And what can we get from here? Is uh, here we, uh, we can see the proportion of variance of the effects. So for instance, for the for the chromosome, for the marker on chromosome four, it will explain around 5% of the phenotypic variation, but the QTL on chromosome five is explaining around 43% of the, the phenotypic variation in, in our data set. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Could you elaborate on the dominance option? Yes. Uh, yes, for this workshop, I only use the additive dominance, but uh, you can model this differently. So if you go back here on dominance and a scan one, I just use one, but you can use digenic dominance, regenic dominance, and how uh, I'm going to explain a little bit about that on the haplotype effects plot, but uh, at the same time, when you're feeding a QTL, you can also talk about the dominance of that specific QTL. So for people that are working with uh, QTLs that have been previously described, and you know that perhaps this uh, specific gene has an additive dominance or is a total dominance, you can change these parameters here. So for both of these QTLs, I consider that it was just a single dominance meaning additive dominance. Um, here, would you like more data? I don't know if that answered your question. I was just wondering about the parametrization of uh, how you uh, how you specify different types of uh, dominance. Uh, there must be uh, other 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 dominance types in, in a tetraploid uh, species like potato, for instance. Right. So yeah, that was my, that yes. was my issue. So issue. You, will, you will just change this dominant to two, three or four. 
Um, so here, I just want to show you this and it will let me explain a little bit about dominance too. When you look at the haplotype, the additive haplotype effect of this uh, model, so you will have, for instance, in this example, I have three different parents and each parent has four, di four different haplotypes, right? So this plot is telling you the additive effect of these haplotypes. So for, in, for this specific example, we have biomaturity. So haplotype one and two will uh, have a positive effect on having a late maturity and the haplotype three and four has the opposite, the opposite effect, meaning that you will have an early maturity. So when you look at this a specific uh, plot, you can determine which haplotypes are the ones that you would like to keep, in, for instance, in your breeding population. In the specific example of W6511, we know that the haplotype 2 is the haplotype that will give us early maturity compared to these three haplotypes. So uh, what we're going to do and R is that, okay, once I identify which haplotype is the, the haplotype that is desirable, I can uh, use this uh, function haplotype get that will uh, get me all the haplotypes of my, uh, of my uh, data set for that specific uh, marker. And then you can identify all the individuals that have for instance, two copies of that haplotype, and that will also be reflected in having a much earlier maturity. So when you run the function haplotype plot, you will get this. Um, this specific individual that is across from this parent and this parent, you can see that from this parent, it has only inherited the haplotype two. How this happens? Because in potatoes, we can observe double reduction, meaning that they could, uh, during the, the gamete formation, you can inherit the same copy that is being duplicated. And that's also one of the advantage of using poly origin because it will allow you for the identification of double reduction. Other softwares will might you uh, try to feed that it has to inherit two haplotypes from each parent, uh, which sometimes is not true in potatoes, especially if you're working with potatoes, this is very helpful. So once you do this, you identify all the individuals that have two copies of this specific haplotype here. And if you're working on breeding, you could use that specific, you can select this as a parent, and then when you make a cross, you will always inherit the haplotype of your interest. So that, that's the utility of this specific analysis. And I'm running a little bit out of time, but I wanted to go through the GWAS poly, the GWAS poly that runs much faster than DiaQT also. If you haven't installed the software, you can do it by running these two lines. So you will load the data. For this, for GWAS poly, the, the files that you need as the phenotype, that like we mentioned before, could be already the, the blues or blabs that you have previously calculated. Or you can have in the phenotypes also the last columns as your factors. And in your model, you should be able to add that in. So there is one stage or two stage analysis. One stage analysis means that when you do the, uh, the GWAS, in one stage means that in the model, you will add your factors like environments or blocks or any other factor that you have in your study. And then you will add all that information in your model for uh, identifying here uh, other QTLs. But two stage analysis means that previously you have to calculate these blues or blabs, and you are only going to use this file in your uh, in your analysis here on GWAS Poly. So you can do it either way. And in my tutorial here, I'm always uh, including the links 
of the of each of the packages that I'm using. So when you open these, it will give you there is some vignettes that will give you some examples about how how to run it and how to use different data sets. So if you go through my tutorial, here's the vignette, here's the website for the for the package, and, and there's more details there. So for that specific, uh, for this data set, uh, where uh, like for DiaQtl, I can only use interconnected families, but for JWAS Poly, I can use a diversity panel. The panel that I have in here has 586 individuals, which is much larger than the previous analysis. And again, these do not need the pedigree file that some people were asking me earlier. So it doesn't matter if they don't have uh, interconnected parents or anything like that. It could be a diversity panel as well. And the phenotypic file has one factor that is uh, the environments, the environment. And you can see this here. So detecting following fixed effects is the environment. And the trait detected is by maturity. When you are entering the data here, you always put the number of traits because after the list, the column of the individuals, you have the columns with the traits. If you have more columns than one, it will take whatever is remaining as factors. And in our case, our factor is as numeric because it's the environment. Um, okay, let's go to QTL discovery. So one of the new things about GWAS Poly is that it has this, uh, function that is leaving one chromosome out, which is the local method. Uh, it was implemented last year and as it should be, it's, it's working pretty well for polyploids. Uh, so that's, that's how we're, we're running it currently. And the models again that I'm including on this analysis on, is only additive. Like uh, you, like Jada was asking me before, you can change this to one dominance model, uh, which will include more. So pattern is asking, can we factor in the model, the population structure as a fixed effect? Yes. So if you have on your, in your phenotypic file, it could be added at the end as another column. And you can put their population structure. You can put TC1 or you, whatever population structure you have on, if you would like to, yes. And uh, so you will set the parameters. These are the default parameters. Again, you can change that. Do you, do you, if you are following, Jacob, do you see that error as well? Uh, I don't think I see the error. Yes, um, I don't know, but you may be make sure that you have run each of the lines. Error in set K. So in JV's oh, ask, does, is, is paternity, are, are they refusing the newest? Uh, do they just download GWAS Poly? Because if you have an old version, it doesn't have uh, uh, Lee one chromosome oh, out. That okay. might be the issue. That might be the okay. issue. Yeah, you have to okay, download I, the latest version. Possibly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, old, it is a new feature. No. So Sanjeev is asking, is there any assumption for the type of trait distribution suitable for JWAS Poly or does it work equally good for any type of trait distribution wise? It should work. I have, you can use binary traits. The way you code it will be different in DIAQTL because you have to code it as Y and N. So please go to the vignette and it has an example for binary trait as well. And here, this, this works for binary trace as well. Yes, it works. Yeah, you, yeah, good. So if you update the version of your GWAS poly, it should work. Lily is asking if 
uh, can G was poly be used to generate effect sizes at this point? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that, by effect sizes. Lily, are you there? Yeah, maybe effect size isn't the, isn't the right word. I'm thinking about like um, the estimated impact of each of the like- The QTL. On yes. The so okay. the QTL effect, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I was just getting into it. So once you run that, you uh, you can see that G was poly will detect a very strong QTL again on chromosome five. Uh, and to calculate the effect of this QTL, what you need to do is you will assign QTL to get QTL. Here, when you set get QTL function, it will tell you which QTLs you find. So you have this peak on chromosome five, and then you have a little peak on chromosome six. As you can see, there is just this one marker right here that just barely made it through the threshold. So to calculate the QTL effect, that I think that was your question, you will uh, run this feed QTL function. And in here, you're going to feed the name of the markers that you want to calculate the effect. And here, uh, the output from here will tell you that, for instance, the marker on chromosome five, that was the QTL that you, you have to write the name of the marker here, is explaining around 33% of the phenotypic variation. And the, the marker on chromosome six, that we can see that little peak, uh, explains around 4% of the phenotypic variation in our data set. So that's how you calculate. Um, the QTL effect. Yes, that's very helpful. Is there any other questions? Because otherwise I will need to pass to Gabriel. How, there's one more question. How do you determine the max genome frequency? Where, where, where are you, Maria, in the script? Uh, I think it's under params, uh, three, line 300 maybe? 300 something? 311. The, G, G the genome frequency. frequency. Yeah. Okay, good question. So here uh, you have to, it's the total number of individuals that you, you have in your population. How do you extract the marker effects for general model? For general model, um, that's a good question. So the general model is kind of tricky because it, it doesn't specify if there is a like one specific uh, genotype uh, call that has an effect on it. It's, it has always been hard for me to, to see how the general model will fit better um, in these cases. Um, I haven't tried here to, so here we will have to write general and I think it should still work, but you will have to have the data set that you started with, with uh, including the general model. So that's how you will do it. Right. Yeah, I, I agree because each of them will have a different effect. That's why um, I haven't run it here with the general model, but uh, it will be interesting to try that. Maybe while uh, Gabrielle is speaking, I will try to do that and see how that looks like. What do you think? All right, Gabrielle, you're there. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. So All I right. will stop sharing and I will let you do that.
And okay. again, if you have more questions, just send me an email or you can also use the Slack channel while the workshop is working. All right, thank you, Maria. Um, so I start the, the second part of today's session. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Gabriel. Um, I'm a postdoc here at North Carolina State University. And can you see? No, let me share my screen first. So I'm not sure if you can see that. Let me know when you can see my, my screen, please. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. So uh, as, I, as I was telling you, my name is Gabriel. I'm a postdoc here at North Carolina State University. And I will give you just a brief introduction on on QTL mapping in polyploids. Uh, it's the same. So the, the procedure works the same way as Maria was, was already telling you and going through the, the tutorial. So I just wanna uh, retake it so we can explain better, explain how it works in the QTL poly, which is the package I, I I'll be guiding you through. So uh, just to let you know beforehand, QTL poly works uh, coupled with map poly, which is the package Jikin showed you uh, last week. And we'll be using the same data set as Jikin was using, which is a, an auto tetraploid rows data set. And, um, and that's it. So I, I just guide you through the, the main ideas. So as you already, uh, many of you already know, so QTL mapping is the, so any QTL is a region of the DNA that contributes to the variation of any quantitative trait. So the basic idea of the QTL mapping is try to associate the variation we can get with markers with the variation we can see on phenotype sides. So we, we essentially make use of markers that might be in linkage disequilibrium with those QTLs. And we, we, we perform statistical tests to try to identify those QTL regions, uh, test for their significance, of course, and estimate the, their location in the genome, their effects, and study the, their behavior. Um, so just to, for, just to, to show you an example, so this is a, a real potato da data set, an auto tetraploid potato data set with 154 individuals. Here we have far, uh, over a little bit over than, uh, 4,000 markers. And this is the genomic real, uh, relationship matrix between, the, between those individuals. Uh, it's a full C population. Of course, it's a mapping population. And as you can see, um, the overall color of this matrix matches with this expected value for the relationship between those individuals with this, which is half, right? So uh, as you can also see for some of those individuals, this value varies uh, a little bit that fluctuates uh, surrounding the 0.5 value. Um, and in this next figure um, on, the, on the left hand side, is the zoom of a few markers that are located in a, in a region where we have one known QTL for this phenotypic trait. trait. So these bars here, can, can you see my pointer? Okay, mm -hmm. this, yeah. uh, these bars here right beside the, the matrix, they represent the, the phenotypes. So they are not ordered here. And you can see any pattern in this matrix. So this matrix is essentially the same as I shown you before, but only using markers that are located in this uh, in a QTL region, in, in, a, in a previously known QTL region. So once you get the same matrix and order them according to the phenotypic uh, variation, uh, to the phenotypic observations, uh, you can see that there is a pattern where individuals that show a higher value for this phenotypic trait they are more related between them. And the same is, we can see the same for individuals that carry uh, a lower value of this phenotypic uh, trait. And between those individuals, there, there is no pattern. So uh, this matrix shows that there is a, an association between those individuals. So individuals that carry uh, the same alleles or kind of uh, alleles with pro, uh, approximate, so alleles that are, um, that have the same effect between individuals, they tend to be more um, similar when we look at the phenotypic and also the marker uh, side. But we here, we, we won't use only the marker. We will, you, we will make use of the markers with uh, in conjunction with other factors that Jikin already shown you last week. So we can reconstruct the haplotypes and increase the information to perform the same analysis 
And by taking the genotype probabilities, we can account uh, for the statistical significance and the and the statistical association between the the variation we can see in the haplotypes with the variation we can see on the phenotype. So that's the main idea. Uh, so just as an example for diploids, we, we can have up to four genotypes in a, in a biparental cross. Uh, if we have uh, two uh, parents with haplotypes at, at any genomic position, we can we can take in them as A, B, and C, D. So two uh, homologs for, for a given chromosome and a given genomic position. Uh, we we will see in the um, we we can expect those four genotypes in the in the progeny A C A D B C and B D. So by performing the linkage analysis, we can take the biallelic markers and and reconstruct these haplotypes on the progeny. And uh, based on the full uh, genotype, the, the full haplotype information, we can expect to have three different uh, levels of association between the different genotypes. So. At this given genomic position, we can have uh, zero uh, shared alleles between individuals. We can have one and two. For tetraploids, we have uh, more genotypes. We have 30, up to 36 genotypes in the progeny, and we have up to five levels of relationship uh, between uh, genotypic classes or individuals at this given uh, genotypic position. We can have uh, no, any, no allele shared between an individual up to four are all the alleles shared between two individuals in the population. And for hexaploids, this increases a lot. We, we have up to 400 genotypes and seven different levels of, of uh, relationship between individuals. And this increases uh, exponentially when we, we increase the ploid level. So, um, so the procedure that is implemented in QTL poly was uh, proposed by Guy. Uh, He's a professor, uh, Guilherme da Silva Pereira. He's a professor at the University of Viçosa in Brazil. And this was, uh, he proposed this method when he was a postdoc here at NEC State. And uh, this was presented in, in this paper and uh, implemented in QTL Poly. And last year when I joined the group, I took over the, ma the maintenance of the package. So I have been maintaining it since then. And uh, I will just explain a little bit of the model. So. Um, he proposed a multiple interval mapping model, uh, multiple inter interval mapping procedure using random effect, a random effect model where you have the phenotypic observation composed by the, uh, the intercept of the model, the sum over all the, the key TLs plus residuals. And all uh, each one of these key TLs can be modeled according to uh, this formula here where you have a genomic relationship matrix and each QTL has the, their own variance component. So uh, the steps to perform the, this QTL mapping is, uh, they, they are as follows. So we have a model, a new model where we don't have any QTL. And then we perform a forward search where we add one putative QTL at a time, according to a significance level or a threshold. Uh, we determine we, we make use of resampling uh, a resampling method to determine this significance level and then we start to add each genomic position to this model and test for this significance so we keep doing this uh, until we don't find any more uh, significant position so the the model is stopped there then we perform the second step which is the model optimization so we can reevaluate every ktl that was included in the model in the, in the previous step, conditional to all the other QTLs in the model. So at this point, we increase a little bit the significance level. So we, we also determine this using a uh, resampling method that, that I'll show you. And after that, we finalize the model by refining the positions of each QTL. Uh, and also at this time, we can proceed with the backward elimination of all KTLs. So we keep doing this iteratively until no mod, no KTL is added nor dropped from the model. Uh, so this implement, so this is implemented in the KTL poly package. Uh, this package is available on CRAN, so we can install using the, the common um, R install package common. Uh, 
the package includes both uh, the fixed and the random effect approaches. So if you want to compare how does your model and the, your data set will perform under a fixed approach, you can do that and compare with the random effect based model. And uh, the package also supports phenotypic weights where you have multiple stages or different models to analyze your data set. So if you this is especially important when you have um, um, unbalanced designs and you want to you want to make use of those weights in this in the second step analysis, which would be the QTL mapping by itself. And as I said before, the, the package is available on CRAN, and we are working on upcoming features, which are uh, which will be the support for a single step analysis, uh, support for multiple trait and multiple environment models, and also multi-parental populations, as Maria was, was telling you before, using the IQTL. So let's jump right to the code. I will share with you the the location of the data set in the code so we can follow together. Let me just find here the chat. So the first link is just the QTL Poly web page. I'll show you it briefly. So here you find more information about the package and also related packages, how to install it from CRAN and from GitHub using the development version. Um, you will find uh, two tutorials, one that we have been updating since the package was released, and, and this other one was uh, the, the tutorial that Guy developed for the first uh, edition of the tools for polyploids, and also some related software that might be of interest of anyone that's working with uh, polyploid crops. Um, and the second link is this GitHub repository. So if you want to follow together with me uh, on the tutorial and on the using this the same data set, you can just open this second link here, click here on code, download zip, and you'll be able to save it whatever you want. I will save it in my home directory. So then I will open it, extract this file, enter the folder, and then I will open this QTL poly start guide.r. So you can directly open it with R Studio, so everything will be ready for you to run. Um, I will take advantage of Jikin and Maria tip on how to set the, the working directory. So if you by any chance have your R Studio open before using a different directory, you can go to session set work directory to source file location. You won't have uh, issues when reading the files that are necessary to go through this tutorial. So if you haven't worked with QTL Poly before, you can just run this command here, install.package QTL Poly. It will be installed directly from CRAN. You don't need to worry with any other dependencies or any extra packages. I will do everything you need to, to have it properly installed. So uh, please install it if you don't have it. I already have the package here, so I use the second command here, library QTL poly. I let these two lines here commanded because uh, one may, may want to try the development version. So if you want to try it, you, you can uncomment these two lines here and install it from my GitHub page. And it should work uh, exactly the same way as it were installed in the from, from CRAN. Okay. So next step would be loading the genotype probabilities. So this file was generated from uh, using map poly. Jikin generated it already in the in the last um, in the last uh, week session. So I will, I will load it from my computer. Please let me know if you, if you cannot load it. Uh, if you cannot load it, it's probably some, any issue with uh, setting your work indirectly correctly. So please let me know if you cannot read it. So let's take a look at this object. 
this object is essentially an array with three dimensions where you have uh, four. So you have three dimensions here. You have the first dimension is the genotype. So is this, a, this is a, an auto tetraploid uh, population. So you, you have 36 genotypes, possible genotypes in the progeny. So this, I will show you only the 10 first ones for the first individual, which is the last dimension, and for the first two uh, genomic positions. So as you can see, these values are really small, but the sum over all columns here for one individual should be one. Okay, so let me show you all of them. So yeah, um, let me know, is this good to see? I, I'm not sure if this the text is good in this in a good size, okay. So you can see the 36 possible genotypes here for one to so the first individual in the population and the two first genomic positions. Okay, so we have this array for all 36 genotypes and all genomic positions and all individuals in the in the population. And that will be our the basis for our KTL mapping model. So once we have that loaded, we, we need to get the phenotypic data. I just loaded it with this command here. Let's take a look at it. So we have a data frame here with um let me let me show you in a different way. Here. So we have as row names, we have the individuals in the population, and we have here three traits. Okay, I, I just increase the text a little bit. Is it better? Okay. So here we have the individuals as row names and the call names uh, are those three traits. Uh, I'm not sure what are those traits, Chicken, if you wanna just tell us a little bit about um, it. So the severity of blues is like the severity of this rose rosette uh, disease. The mm -hmm. CT is the CT score from the qPCR for detecting the C, the the virus, and then the qPCR binary is just presence or absence, just based off the CT value. So oh, okay. if it yeah if it was detected, then it was uh, zero, and then if it wasn't detected, it, it got a one. So it's on the same scale as the CT. All right, All right. thank you, thank you very much, Juki. So yeah, so uh, if you were running with your own data. You just need to make sure you have this this exactly the same structure. So you have the the adjusted means from a previously run model, and um, each one of the adjusted means would be the columns for actually each one of the traits you have needs to be one column in this uh, data frame, and you need to make sure that the individuals' names they match with the genotypic data set. So. Uh, once you run the read data, the read data, this function here from uh, KTL Poly, it will try to check if the individual's name match. So if if they don't match, it will give an uh, so the package will give you an error. So you need to fix that. So just make sure the individual's name match, and you'll be able to run everything on the on the tutorial. Okay. So for this example, we already made sure it's working, so you don't need to worry about that. So uh, the first function inside the package is this read data. You need to indicate the ploidy level of your crop. Uh, the object that carries the genotypic probabilities, here we have the genoprob for X, which is this, uh, this object we generated before. The phenotypic observations here, and this step. So this step is um, um, at, at, so, it will indicate every, every centimorgan you want to run it. So if you want to run your KTL model with a, a reduced amount of positions in your genome, you can set it to a higher number, for example, two, three, or five. Uh, here we use one centimorgan, so the model will perform one, uh, will try to adjust one KTL at, at every centimorgan across your genome. So let's run it. It will take a few seconds to generate the data set. Uh, during this time, it is trying to match if individuals' names are, are the same. Um, 
if all the values are are in the correct uh, format, and if you are if your genotypic probabilities is not corrupted, so it tries to avoid any any error here at this point. So once you got this data read, read using the, the QTL poly package, everything will be good to go. So here it is indicating us that uh, we have an, an auto test applied uh, population with 161 individuals, seven, seven linkage groups, which you can map it next, uh, last week. We have a step size set to one cent Morgan. We have uh, the map size is 520 cent Morgans. And we have three phenotypes available as we saw in the Pheno4x object here. So the next step would be trying to determine the genome-wide significance levels uh, level for uh, the KTL search. So as I, I mentioned before, we need to define two thresholds, one for KTL addition or the KTL search by itself. And the second one would be the, the stringent um, significance level where we have already some KTLs in the model and then try to find more KTLs and remove and test test other KTLs that are already in the model and remove them using a, a more stringent threshold. So I won't run this, uh, these commands here right now because they take longer to run, if, especially if you want to run with a higher number of simulations. But it's, it's essentially an score-based statistics uh, run across multiple resample, resamples uh, using the real data set. So I, if you want to run that, if you want to try in your own data set, you just need to uncomment those lines here, those two lines, and run them in your own data set. Um, as it takes longer, um, you can have provided us with this RDS scar.nu-rds file, with, which is the result of this uh, resampling method run for this data set. So you can just load it with this command here and run this other command here where you just uh, reorganize the results and you can get uh, the significance levels for both the search and the um, optimization steps on the, on the model. So if you want to take a look at it, so the, the, the forward search would, would be based on the 0.00 two nine uh, significance level and uh, backward elimination would be based on a 0 0.0005 um, significance level here. So I would follow you through the first trait here because it takes a little bit to run. So I just demonstrate uh, the manual search on how it works for one phenotype and then we can run for all of them automatically together. So here uh, we need to indicate the data set where we just read with this read data read data function we need to indicate uh, the phenotypic column we want to run this model so if you want to run for all phenotypes just um, just remove this argument and, and it, it will run across all phenotypes that are, are available in our data set and also, if you want to run this um, faster and you have higher computational power, you can increase this n clusters argument so it will run faster in parallel. Okay. Here, as I'm running my own laptop, I will just use one part. And this is the first step of the KTL of the of the method I, I described to you before. So we need to start from a new model. So that's what this function new model is doing. So it's essentially calculating the score statistics for each one of the positions in the genome. Uh, we are not considering any significance level here. And we are just getting the score statistics for all positions. I just switch here, just um, if you want to follow me, if you are following through the, the same uh, code, please change this significance level here for the one we have here. Okay, so you can just copy here and paste here. Okay. All right, so as, as you can see for the first trait, um, we have the no model run. So if you want to print the results, it will say you that there is no KTL in the model. 
So based on this new order, we will, pro we will proceed with the first search round. Here we need to indicate on the on this function search ktl the data set, the model we will be based on. So uh, we need to start from the new model. So please indicate it here. We need to define a window size. Uh, here we consider 15 centimorgans. We, we need to define a significance forward search uh, threshold, which, which is this, the value we, we got from the resampling method. And if you want to run this faster, please uh, increase this N clusters uh, if you have uh, a good, a powerful machine. So let's, let's proceed with this first search round. So while the function runs, it will tell us uh, if any KTL is, is found. So it is essentially uh, telling us that one KTL was found at linkage group number five, position 7.44 centimorgans. Uh, I forgot to mention, but please interrupt me if you if you have any questions. You can you can ask at any time or send on the chat or open your mic and and ask your question. Jikin, and also if you have any comment or want to talk about anything, you 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 know this data set very well, so please feel free to do that. So in the in the manual search. It usually takes one to two, to two minutes at each step. But at the end of it, I will show you another function that performs the KTL search automatically. And it's a, it, it is faster, so you don't need to wait at each step. It goes and keep going, iterating over, the, over all the search and optimization steps automatically until the model it's stabilized, so no, no KTL is removed or added to the model. Let's wait a little bit. All right, so no more KTL was found. We have one KTL at chromosome five, position seven centimorgans. Um, the software also tells us that a putative KTL on linkage group number two uh, presented a, a very low p-value, but it, it, it didn't reach the threshold we indicated. So we would we, we, we will not include this KTL in the model as of now. So next step would be pr uh, proceeding with the optimi optimization step. So I would take the second, now the second threshold value and include here. So the function works with the same, essentially the same arguments as the first as the search KTL. So we need to indicate where is the data. Uh, the model we start on, at this time we, we will be based on the search, on the result from the search KTL function. We need to define our significance backward elimination threshold. And also, if you have a, a powerful machine, you can increase this N clusters number. So let's proceed with this, with this command. So it's telling us that the model has one KTL in the model already. So this is faster. Uh, all right. So now, no no more KTL was found. We can see from from the resulting object that the same KTL is kept in the model. Linkage group number five, position seven centimorgans. And now I I not run this um, this command here because it would take uh, a while to run. Oh, go ahead. Okay, so I, I won't run this uh, second search because we already know that only this KTL is left in the model and this search KTL takes a, a while to run. So I just update here the significance threshold. So the only thing we need to do if you wanna proceed with it, uh, another round of KTL search is to define data and the model will be based on. So as we already run the optimization model, we need to um, 
get this object and run another search round based on this object. So the model already knows how many KTLs are in the model. At that time, I will reduce the significance threshold. Um, and this, the result of this function will not uh, provide us with any new KTL. And it will also not remove this KTL from the model. So we, we essentially have the same object here. OK. So now we finished our KTL search procedure, and we want to get the profile for um, all genomic positions. The, the, so the LOP, L -O -P, which is the equivalent of the logarithm of the odds. Uh, when we think of the fixed approach on the other uh, KTL mapping methods. So we will essentially use the model, the optimization model we run, the last model we run, the data set we have. And uh, this, this descent argument, it defines, a, it, it will define, it will help define the supporting interval for the KTL. So it will essentially take the highest LOP in and subtract 1.5 from this from this value and determine this uh, region as the supporting interval for the KTLs. These polygenes, uh, I will keep it false because we have only one KTL, but um, the default of the, the software will be to estimate one, one variance component for each KTL that is in, identified. But for, if for any reason you wanna, you, you have, uh, a lot of small KTLs that you, you can find in a small region, and you suppose that these KTLs that they, 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 they are they are reflecting one single KTL, you can turn this um, argument to true. So you 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 estimate only one uh, variance component for this set of KTLs in your in your model. Okay. And also you have the option to increase the number of, of clusters if you want to run this faster. So remember, we'll be running this for only one, uh, the first phenotypic evaluation, the phenotypic trait, I'm sorry. Takes a lot to run. Yeah, it's taking a little bit more than when I was running this by alone without the zoom open. Probably the zoom is lagging a little bit. All right, so the function finished. We have now the profile. We can see that only one KTL was left in the model. Oh, Maria, um, I see here you got a warning using varcom function. Okay, so probably, um, I don't know if you try to increase the number of cars for uh, at any time. But this is essentially saying that um, you you started you you initialized a, a cluster, and you you are only closing an in 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 unused connection, and you you don't need to to worry about that. So it it, it didn't give you an error, so you will be able to see the results of your analysis. So as far as as far as by my experience, you you don't need to worry about that. So please let, let me know if you cannot see that. The results so we can try to figure it out together. 
Um, okay, so here we have the KTL, um, same position, same chromosome. Uh, we have the score statistics associated with this position and the p-value. And uh, if you want to see the profile, how... Oh. I don't know what happened. I got that issue too. Right. I don't know why. Oh, I know why. So we have to uh, determine uh, to put this data argument and the model. So that's that's the reason. Were you we were able to to see it, chicken? Data if data the model. It's running now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry for that. I forgot to, <laughs> to include the data in the tutorial. So, uh, Alexander, I don't know if you you said you got the same error. I'm not sure if this is the same error I got here, but please just include the data and the model. So just put this argument and you'll be able to see. All right. So it's working now. Okay. Good. So. Okay, so as we as we can see here, we have the the LOP profile with the, all the the minus log uh, of the p values for all genomic positions, and and you can see the the KTL peak here right at the beginning of the fifth chromosome for this this first trait. Okay, so. You can also use the same object, the profile.mod, to, to print the lower and the upper interval, um, supporting interval. So uh, the lower supporting interval would be the position number zero for this chromosome. So it takes since the beginning up to the position 19.87 St. Morgans. OK, so this is the supporting interval for this KTL. And um, as I told you, this is the manual search, and we have implemented another function, which is called Reming. Reming stands for Random Effect Multiple Interval Mapping. And this function essentially provides you an automated way to search for KTL. So you, you just need to tell the function where your data is here using this data argument. Where is your no score uh, resampling object? If you have one, if you don't have, you can just uh, skip this argument and determine the significance for the forward and the backward and the backward elimination uh, by hand. So you can type here uh, in these two arguments. You can also define the window size. I will keep it 15 here and the supporting interval factor you can Defined using this d.sint argument and also the number of clusters if you want to, if you have a powerful machine. I will run here. So, you all of you that install the package from CRAN, you will only have this uh, reming function. And we just released another version of this function, which runs um, a little bit faster, which is reming2. I will run this because I, I have this in my computer. If you install it from GitHub, you also have this function available in your computer, but don't worry. Uh, they both provide the same results. The only difference is the, the speed, okay? So for a regular laptop, you can expect from two to four minutes for each run, uh, while the remaining two will take about 20 seconds. Okay, so I just load my one package that is necessary to run. So oh, another thing I forgot to mention is the phenocall. So if you want to run this for only one phenotypic um, phenotypic trait, you can indicate here if you want to run for the first or for the second or for the third. I will just remove these arguments because I want to run for all traits um, sequentially. OK, so I just started. If you are following. Uh, the tutorial, please let me know if you can run this this command here. Again, uh, remain two won't be available for you if you install this from CRAN, okay? Only if you install this from GitHub. So this function uh, provides us the same output here. We can 
while the, the function runs across the, the traits and across the crumbs, the, 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 the genome, you can see for each trait uh, where the KTLs are being found or not. And if you have any other putative KTLs in other positions, so you see essentially the same outputs of all the other functions uh, sequentially, okay? So for the first search and the optimization and then another round of search and then the refining. Okay. Yeah, I told it, it, it will run in 20 seconds. Um, I benchmarked it without Zoom running in my laptop. So that's probably the reason it's a little bit longer. Jikin, let, let me ask you a question about the trades. So are they so do you expect they, they to be related somehow, like correlated or something like that? How which ones? So these three trades, do you expect them yeah. to be correlated? Okay. Because yes. I yes. yeah, I just noticed that they they all of them they fall in the same chromosome. Yes, they should be. Okay. Good. So once like the that first trait is the phenotypic um scoring and then the other ones more molecular work all right mm -hmm. and they should be mm -hmm. um, because if the virus is in the plant it should show the symptoms but mm -hmm. it's not a perfect all right correlation yeah and also i just noticed that uh the putative ktl on linkage group number two they are kind of uh, so yeah. they appears for all of them right Mm -hmm. so that, yeah so yeah another thing to to discuss after so yes so as you can see this function runs uh for all traits you might have in our data set and it performs the search the ktl search automatically so you don't need to worry about um going through all different functions and going around and performing multiple cycles and iterating manually so it iterates uh automatically okay so you don't need to mm -hmm. worry about that here we see that um, for the all traits, we, we found one KTL at the linkage group number five. The positions can vary a little bit, but uh, you can just mention that they are, these traits are kind of correlated. So that's why we, we, we see they, they fall in the same, in kind of similar positions, okay? So here we can, we can get the same way, the lower and the upper, um, supporting interval for all the KTLs and their associated score statistics and p-values. Um, we can we can get the KTL, uh, the, the LOP profile for all the traits. So we have, we, we can make use of the same function plot profile. Um, when you have multiple traits like we have here, uh, this grid may be uh, one, one important arguments where if you want to put them separately you just set grid to true so you have, you have the the traits plot separately let me show so yeah so as you can see here you you'll be able to see the traits um um uh, in uh so they, they, they are not overlap okay so so they are one on top of the other so you can compare the positions and the and the profile so as we, we can see the profile for for these three traits they are kind of the same and uh, the KTLs, they match. So uh, we can also see them overlap when we set the, this grid argument to false. Here, we can see the three plot curves uh, together overlap and, the, and their KTL estimated positions here. Okay. You can also use the argument SUPINT equals true. INT, yeah equals true and that's pretty mm -hmm. cool you then you have the support intervals too oh okay yeah that's true yeah <laughs> thanks jikin so yeah so we can plot this uh supporting intervals and see them and compare them at the same time yeah thanks so it's jikin. probably probably the same thing that's underlying those two the the support intervals kind of yeah, all yeah. overlapping yeah yeah thanks jikin so yeah yep. this is this is really good and um 
yeah if you have uh, um multiple trades that's another uh function you, you you can plot the supporting intervals uh with the trades side by side and you can compare their positions and supporting intervals so it's a it's a different way to see what the previous plot was showing us and we have another function which is a uh, fit model we need to indicate our data set our uh, the model the type of probabilities we want and the polygenes uh, if you want to if you have one of these situations we mentioned before like multiple small uh, ktl effects in in a small region and you want to estimate one single variance component for it you can change this um these arguments here otherwise just run with the default values and you'll be able to get the variance uh, let me just increase here okay so for each one of these traits you have uh other uh so the model related information so their position uh the, the intercept value the variance component that associated with this ktl uh, the residual variance and also the heritability of this ktl so as we can see they are very similar to each other and also so this plot ktl is another another function to see you, you you can you can take a look at, at the ktls at the same time so we have the the traits here and the lines and the the columns would, would be the different chromosomes but as we have only one chromosome that's why you, you only see one square here and uh the p-value so the size and the color of those dots here they represent the p-value and the heritability of the one of each one of those ktls and finally we can have we can get the uh estimated effects for each one of those ktls so we'll be able to see a figure uh similar to the one maria showed us so for each parent we have uh four uh, four haplotypes here uh and we can see that the first for this this is the last trait right you can mm -hmm. so this key key q pcr binary binary we have the first haplotype of the first parents contributes positively to this trait while the third one and the second one contributes uh negatively to, to to reduce the value of this phenotype and we can get this image for all the other traits so we see a similar pattern for this ct yeah and we, we can have this for the first trait as well and which is flipped. a little different yeah. so it's flipped. okay because the severity low here is good oh okay and so, then qpcr the higher numbers so it's an inverted uh, yeah. scale right? yeah, they're inversed yeah okay okay good and also using this breeding values uh function you can um uh, get the estimated breeding values for all individuals in the population considering the ktl you just uh found okay so i just plot for the the last value so we, we can see the distribution across the progeny okay for all the individuals the predicted values according to this ktl at chromosome number five uh last of all we have the we also have the fixed effect approach implemented here you 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 may want to run the permutation test based on your data set so here i will reduce the number of simulations to 10 just to show you how to run this so um you need to indicate the data set the phenotypic of uh, the phenotypic trait you want to run number of simulations and number of clusters of course in your machine it is significantly faster than the random based approach um all right so we can take a look at the significance of the quantiles we would take the 95 quantile as the significance threshold and we can run use this at uh P F E I M, which stands for fixed effect interval mapping just indicate your data set the phenotypic trait you want to run window size and the significant threshold so it will run i will run only for the first trait here just to show you okay so as you can see we find the same ktl here it shows us the lrt the likelihood the ratio test and the lot associated with it as well as the r square 
We can also use this object to plot the profile and see the, the QTL. So as you can see, the QTL is located in the same position, but at this time we are using a, a different approach to, to find for it. So just, and finally, these last lines of our script, they're meant if you wanna see uh, and use the this, uh, if you wanna explore your the results of your data set, um, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, so QTL poly is coupled with map poly and we have this other tool with which was, uh, led and developed by Chris Taniguchi. Um, this tool is able to uh, get gather all the results from map poly, QTL poly, and if you have other genomic information, and also results from other softwares, including uh, Dio QTL and other uh, poly polymapper and QTL um, poly QTLer, you can just save uh, the results the way uh, it is written in this data set. It is. I'm sorry, this is script here, and you'll be able to load directly to Viopoly and explore your results, okay? So that's it. I have planned to talk to you and show it to you before, uh, to show you today. Uh, please let me know if you have any issues or any comments, suggestions, or uh, let me know if you have questions. Uh, please feel free to open your mic or write down in, on the chat so we can try to figure it out together, any, any errors or any issues you, you, you had along this tutorial, okay? Jiken, I don't know if you wanna uh, say anything about this, uh, okay. No. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add one thing, um, just because Gabriel mentioned it. So when you are loading the data to DiaQTL, I did mention that DiaQTL has a function to uh, take the outputs from polyorigin, but it also has different functions to take uh, outputs from map poly, rabbit, and one map. So if you have the haplotypes from this, the, hap, the genotype probabilities from these uh, different softwares, you can also uh, read the data uh, using these these specific functions. Mm -hmm. And kind of the key difference, because I've used both Dark QTL and QTL Poly, the key difference if your input from Dark QTL is poly origin and from poly origin you don't supply a linkage map and you use the physical order and you estimate um the 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 linkage um it's not a true like it's just estimating the haplotype you're you're really trusting the physical order uh, and most crops that works fine if you if you have a well annotated genome and your physical order aligns really closely with um how your linkage maps would be, um, that's that's fine. That's one key difference and key um, approach because with QTL poly, map poly, you're developing a linkage map that is that that order is specific to that population, um, and most of the time it also follows the order of the physical. Um, but if you just go straight poly origin and only use the physical order, um, that Cindemorgan value isn't the same meaning as a Cindemorgan value that you get from um, bot parental mapping. Well, if, there, <clears throat> if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank uh, Maria and Gabrielle for, for wonderful presentations and input from Chris and uh, Jeekin as well. Um, again, if you have any other questions, you can email them or you can uh, use the Slack channel to, to ask questions. They do do watch it and we'll, we'll respond to you.